Hello, and welcome to our lecture on shear analysis. So our objectives for today are first to discuss the ACI code requirements for shear reinforcement, as well as to outline what actually is shear reinforcement as well as shear design. Then we're going to analyze as our first step beams in shear. And then in the next lecture, we'll move on to the design of beams in shear. So all of this discussion about what is shear, so let's talk about it for a few minutes. Just as we designed a beam for bending due to moment, we also have to analyze and design a beam to make sure that we don't have a shear failure, particularly when we have very high loads, either from an applied load or from the reaction, you could have a shear failure. Now, shear failures tend to be sudden. They tend to be more brittle failures. And for that reason, we're definitely concerned about more of a catastrophic failure that results from what we call a diagonal tension failure, which is a result of shear stress. Now, typically, the, we typically tend to see a shear crack occur at a distance D from a support or a concentrated load. Now, this particular drawing isn't very, isn't quite to scale. But let me show you what we're talking about here. Again, the D that we've been referring to all semester long was the effective depth D. So technically, we should have seen the crack emanate from a distance D from the support. So this would have been more to scale. So very similar to the effective depth that we use for bending, we also use that as the starting point or the critical point, V U sub C, for where the critical shear will occur. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. So exactly what is shear reinforcement? Well, all semester long you've been working with them. The shear actually comes from the stirrups. The stirrups keep the um, beam or T-beam or whatever structure we're working with to act as one whole unit and not to separate due to the diagonal tension failure that's due to shear. So stirrups are typically in a loop fashion. We'll show you other versions as well. So a vertical loop, and they're spaced at a specific distance S along the span of the beam. And again, their purpose is to avoid shear failure. The different types of stirrups that you'll see are the vertical stirrup, which is the one that we'll design for. So an example here is the vertical stirrup, where if we're looking at it from a side or even from, from uh, an elevation, as it's shown here, this is the, from above, you'll see one loop, spacing, another loop, spacing, another loop, spacing, another loop. And then typically you'll have, I'm sorry, this is looking at as an elevation from the side. So this is the main rebar that you'll see that we, we have been designing for bending. So our main rebar will be at the bottom of our section to, con to reduce um, failure from tension or to take the tension from, from the loading. And the stirrups can either also be an inclined or diagonal stirrup. So if instead of picturing it vertically, they could be placed on an angle. They could be main reinforcement bent on an end. You might see that in some applications, particularly in transportation. Or it could be in a spiral format, very similar to a spiral that you would see in a column. But for our purposes, for this course, we're going to focus just on the vertical stirrup. So what are the code requirements when you're working with a vertical stirrup? Well, first, concrete can handle some shear. Again, it's not very good in shear, but it can resist some shear. So first what we do is we find out, well, how much of the concrete can, res uh, or what is the amount of force that concrete can resist due to shear, due to shear stress or shear force? So first we determine that resisting capacity for the concrete. Now, the ACI code says that the reinforce, you have to design shear reinforcement if the design shear is greater than half of the resisting strength of the concrete. So one example, one way to phrase it, is that if the concrete can handle, and I'll even draw it, switch up my colors here. So say, for example, the concrete can handle 100 tips of shear force. Now, if we're going to try to apply 
say, 51 kips of applied. So let me show that to you here. So if we're trying to apply 51 kips of shear force, in this case, that's not less than or equal to half of our five factor, which I'll explain in a moment. That's 0 0.75. And if our concrete can handle 100 kips of force, so as you can see for this particular example, if you're trying to apply 51 kips of shear force or the supports are resisting 51 kips or more of, a, of shear or as a reaction, then that means you must provide stirrups. Typically for most of our applications, that's exactly what we need to do. We often apply um, stirrups because we typically have high enough shear loads or reactions that meet this requirement. We'll talk a bit in a moment about what the a critical um, what the critical shear is at the distance d from the face of the support. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Okay, we'll talk about it right here, quite frankly. So as we mentioned, the resisting strength of the beam is a combination of the resisting shear strength of the concrete and the resisting shear strength of the steel, which is the stirrup. Now remember, our goal is that wherever we're applying, so in this case, our maximum or critical shear that we're applying has to be less than or equal to our resisting. Now in this case, our resisting is the combination of the steel and the concrete's resisting strength and shear times our phi factor of 0 0.75. Now, what is this critical, um, this critical shear uh, force that we're applying? As an example, let me see if I can draw a beam for you here. You say a very basic example, we have a, a beam with a distributed load. And we'll assume the supports are at the end. For our purposes, we'll stick with beams with simply supported ends and just a uh, single applied, um, just a distributed load. No point loads in addition. So we would have a reaction at one end and a reaction at the opposite end. Now, when you go to draw your shear diagram, again, just switching up my pen here for you for a moment. So if this is our loading diagram, our shear diagram would look like this. Hopefully you will recall from statics and strength of materials. This is your shear diagram where this is your positive area under the shear diagram, and this is your negative area. Now we talked about a distance D from the support. Again, this is not terribly to scale, so then so this is our effective depth D from the support. Now what we're looking at is our distance D from the support. So our interest is what the critical shear is V U sub C. Again, this is assuming that this is W sub U, so it's a factor distributed load. So when we're designing, we want to know what is the shear at a distance d from the support. And that's the critical value because that's where we're going to assume that the tension failure, would, um, the shear failure, or the diagonal tension failure would begin. So how do we actually design the, the steel, the, the stirrup, to resist or help the concrete resist the shear? So what are some of our equations that we need? So to design the steel for shear, we would take the area. Now this A sub B is the area of steel required. And what we're looking at is if we're cutting our cross section, I'll show you in this just a moment, we're looking at two circular areas because we're cutting across two loops. So how would that look like in our diagram? Or what would that look like in our diagram? If we were to cut across one stirrup, we would have one circular area 
and another circular area. So that's where we get two times the area of our steel, which is typically a number three, and on some rare occasions, a number four. So often, this value A sub V is the area of two number, two number threes, which I believe is 0.11 times two. So that's 0.22 square inches. F sub Y is your yield strength of the steel, your stirrup. D is that effective depth. And S is the center to center spacing of your reinforcement. So again, this is your center to center spacing. Again, I apologize for this. I don't know why that's a repeat right there. Also, the minimum of area of steel required. So very similar to our row factor, where there's a minimum area of steel. The minimum area of steel is equal to, if you look at the entire equation, including our five factor, 0.75, times radical F prime C, which is either 3,000, 4,000, or 5,000 uh, PSI concrete. Typically, that's equal to 50, so it needs to be less than 50, times B sub W, which is the width of the web, which in this case is our width of our beam, or the width of our T-beam. That's why we say B sub W in case it's a T-beam. The center to center spacing, as we stated before, and the yield strength of the steel. Now, typically, the design process for shear is pretty straightforward. You First determine your, um, your applied load, you factor it, then you would look at the shear, um, the shear at a critical section, and then from there, you would determine whether it's adequate or not based on your resisting capacity. So let's try an example problem for analysis. Analysis is reasonably straightforward. However, we have quite a bit of, bit of information to go through. So for our first problem, it says a reinforced rectangular concrete beam is reinforced with seven number six bars in a, a single layer. So as you can see, you have your seven number six bars in a single layer. The span is 20 feet long, and that's the direction or the dimension in and out of the bore that you're looking at now. A uniform factor load of six kips per foot will be applied. Now just in for the sake of um, more simplicity and moving to the problem, we're going to assume that includes the weight of the beam. If it doesn't, you often would be given a dead load, a live load. You would factor them accordingly, so 1.2 times the dead, 1.6 times the live, and then you would also add in 1.2 times the weight of the beam. Now, since this is an analysis problem, we're already told that the stirrups are number threes. So as you can see, we have a number three stirrup in a vertical single loop, and they're placed 12 inches on center vertically between each, uh, each stirrup along the beam. The cover is assumed to be interior exposure, so one and a half inches of cover. We're going to assume that the concrete has a strength of 4,000 PSI, and the steel has a yield strength of 660,000 PSI. So in this question, we're asked to determine, is the beam adequate for shear? So often what happens is that we design the beam for moment, and then we check it to make sure that it, it is adequate for shear. So how do we design our example? So first we want to draw the factored shear diagram V sub U. So very similar to before, we can draw a, a beam. We have our 20 foot span beam. Try to use the same colors as before. We have our distributed live load, which in this case is six kips per linear foot. This is more to give us a visual, but I will show you a shortcut very shortly. And you most likely remember it from steel design. So again, we're assuming simply supported, so the reactions are at either end. Now, since we were, we were told that the six kips per linear foot was a factor load, that's a W sub U. So that means that our supports 
Well, for shear resistance, V sub U. So that's our, rea our reactions are V sub U. Now, if we were to draw our shear diagram, again, it's a very simple shear diagram where you have your V sub U. Decrease linearly at 6 kips per linear foot to your opposite end. Again, the span is 20 feet, so 6 times 20 is 180. 180 divided by 2 is 90. So we know that our maximum shear at the at opposite ends is 90 kips. So I'm trying to make that look like a K. So we can move this down a little bit for you. I'll redraw my kit. Bring this down a little bit. So we know that's our maximum. Again, we have an area of positive shear and negative shear. Again, our interest. And we'll first, so first, let's show our calculation. Now, you probably remember from steel design that you could simply just calculate. Um, Sorry, 6 times 20 is 120, not 180. 120 divided by 2 is 60. My apologies. So our maximum shear is 60 kips, not 90. Just correct that. There we go. So we have a factored shear of 60 kips on either end due to the support. But again, our interest is the, at the critical location, which is a distance V. So first, there we go. So our distance V, we'll go back for a minute, and I'll show that to you. If you notice, in this problem, we were already told what the effective depth was. So this is our effective depth of 33 inches. So we want to know, well, what is the critical value at a distance of 33 inches? Now, if you remember from steel design, you're welcome to use the shortcut. That shear is equal to WL on 2. Or you can draw your shear diagram, whichever one is easiest for you. And then if you draw your shear diagram, you can interpret what the value is for VU sub C at a distance D. Or you can use the equation of a line where your y-intercept is 60, and then you decrease linearly at 6 kips per linear foot over a distance of 33 inches. So it's your choice. You can either use the shear diagram to interpret what VU sub C would be at a distance D. Again, this is VU sub C. Or you can use the equation of a line. So y is equal to mx plus b. That's your choice. Either or will get you that maximum value at a distance d. So we have 60 kips minus 6 kips per linear foot over a distance of 33 inches. And again, I'm dividing by 12 to bring that into uh, inches, so or to cancel out the inches and the feet. And that gives me a value of 43.5 kips. So the critical value at a distance D for the shear is 43.5. Now that we know that, we can start determining, well, what is the strength of the concrete? What is the, the strength of the steel in shear? And then determine whether or not we have enough capacity to resist it. So showing you both. So first, determining the resisting capacity of the concrete which is 2 radical F prime C, BW times D. So we have 2 radical F prime C. Notice that this is in 4,000 PSI. Make sure you always use it in PSI. And the reason why is that if you try to do just radical 4 KSI and make the units consistent, the equation doesn't work. So this is specifically a formula in pounds and inches. 
Again, the width of our section is 18 inches, just to show you in the diagram. So our width of our web is 18 inches, and our effective depth is 33. So we have our 18 and our 33. That gives us a concrete shear resisting capacity of 75.1. Now if we determine the shear resisting capacity of the steel, we have two, two number threes, so two number threes. And again, just to go back, the reason why it's two number threes is if you were to take a cut across one, uh, one stirrup, you would cut across through one diameter of the stirrup, two diameters of the stirrup. So that's why it's two times the area of the stirrup, which is two number threes. Then we have the yield strength of the steel, which is 60 KSI. Effective depth is 33 inches, divided by the spacing. And again, we said the spacing in between each stirrup was given as 12 inches. That gives us a steel shear capacity of 36.3 kips. So now let's add them together and apply our strength reduction factor and determine what our allowable resisting shear is. So we'll do this real quick. So our total resisting shear is the 75.1 plus the 36.3. So we have a total resisting shear of 111.4 kips. Now let's apply the safety factor. Our safety factor for shear, again, because we're concerned about a sudden or a catastrophic failure, that's why we reduce it to 75%. Remember, for beams and bending, it's 90% or 0.9. 75% of 111.4 is 83.55 kips. Now, the question is, again, looking at it, we have 83.55 kips of resisting capacity, and we're concerned about applying 43.5. So the question is, is V sub R greater than V U sub C? Yes, it is, because, let me circle it, V sub R, and actually, let me correct this right here. This is an R, not U. V sub R is 83.55, and V U sub C is 43.6, 43.5, so yes. So therefore, it's adequate. Instead of me writing the word adequate, it's faster for me to draw a smiley face for you guys. So as you can see, see, shear analysis is relatively straightforward. And the reason why is typically most of the work is done up front when you design the beam for bending. Then the second step is simply to check the beam for shear. So as you can see, we would first determine what type of shear is for the, what the shear would be for the critical section. Then we would calculate the capacity of both the concrete as well as the steel. We'd add them together, apply our safety factor, and then compare. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, you are always welcome to find me and ask. Take care.